Welcome to Swiss Cyberstorm in a nutshell, our third edition of Swiss Cyberstorm in a nutshell. With me today is Dr. Miriam dan Cavelti from the ETH Zurich Center for Strategic Studies and Lieutenant General Thomas Susli, Chief of the Swiss Armed Forces. We're going to talk about many, many topics today. Uh, probably I have more on my list than we can cover, but there's a lot of things to talk about. Uh, the Army is uh, on and on in the news, and Dan Mrs. Dan Cavalti has done a lot of research on these topics. Uh, one of the latest news has been that the Swiss Army is going to transform its center for cybersecurity, the so-called FUB. The English abbreviation is very complicated, so we constantly talk of FUB, which is a German term for Führungsunterstützungsbasis. Uh, and this is going to be transformed over the course of several years now into a top-level cyber command. Uh, if we look at this in an international perspective, uh, Mr. Dan Cavalti, how does Switzerland relate to this? Is this a natural step? Are we on the forefront or is it about time to finally do this? Uh, how would you contextualize this? Well, I would say it's all three. <laughs> it's all three and it uh, obviously depends, you know, which aspects you focus on, etc. But that um, armies of the world, but also in strategic, um, you know, establishments of the world are taking cybersecurity and cyber defense and cyber offense uh, seriously. That is absolutely the trend. And a, I would say, focused strategic thinking about what is needed that is also done everywhere. And it's good that okay. Switzerland also does it and takes this step carefully, as I know. <laughs> <laughs> and I think one of the big challenges will be to understand what capabilities are needed and then actually building them up. Because yeah. what, what we also see internationally is that a lot of you know, states say, yes, we are now having a cyber army <laughs> and a cyber command, mm -hmm. but sometimes they don't follow up with the capabilities. And that is a bit of a, a problem and I hope that Switzerland will do better than some other okay, countries. So you think regard. it's more than only the signal? You have to, exactly. have to walk to yes. walk the line. Yes. Okay. So what what do you expect from a cyber command to do what the FUP cannot do or is not supposed to do right now? What are the plans there? Actually, I think <coughs> sorry, it's actually it's mainly a question of focus and this gaining this fighter spirit we don't have today. The current FUB, as you call it, in English it's really boring, it's called <laughs> Command Support Organization um, or Armed Forces Command Support Organization. <laughs> it's a service provider, it's an IT service provider, it's a service provider in the area of telecom and not really focused on cyber. And what we expect really is with, with a clear focus to, to, to increase the capabilities without having to add more resources. Um, at the same time, we were writing a concept, a new general concept for cyber in the armed forces and that will describe the future capabilities and the cyber command will just follow that concept. So there's a conceptual um, overarching idea and then mm -hmm. the cyber command will implement that. Will implement it. The way I've read your latest press release uh, on the topic was that FUB continues to exist and you're building the new organizations next to it and then slowly transfer mm -hmm. tasks over. If you conduct big changes, it's always a question how you do it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And there are different approaches. One might be more kind of a leadership approach where you slowly turn all the heads in an organization. Mm -hmm. um, that might be well, I mean, the benefit of that is you gain a, a, a strong culture. A second approach might be, and that's not suited for our administration, but then you get rid of all the resources you don't need and then you buy in the skills you need actually. And the third approach, this is what we chose now, is you actually build it in parallel, so this, this dualistic <laughs> approach. And what we think is, this give, gives us, first of all, give, gives us time for conceptual work. So to free time to think, to conceptualize, to plan, and then slowly implement. When I say slowly, it's not that slow. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea is to have the command up and running with the same capabilities as today, as of 1st of January 24. So for us, I would say this is rather fast. For a Swiss Army perspective, <laughs> that is for, yeah. for administration. Because for administrations, yeah. okay. Now, um, you're actually you're doing cybersecurity already. Cyber defense within the FUP is a topic. The way I understand it, you, you just said uh, what the tasks are, but there are these closer to cyber war tasks that you carry out in the service of other organizations, like the this, uh, <coughs> the NDB, the National Security Service 
asks the army to carry out a task. Mm -hmm. So this is something that the new cyber command will then take over. Do I? Absolutely. Correct? Yes. Yeah. So it's the intelligence service, mm -hmm. which can also task us for certain for certain tasks to complete. That's this is always based on the on the intelligence service act. This mm -hmm. is the, the legal basis for that. Uh, absolutely. And this is already happening today. That is happening today. Yeah. It's yeah, in the ZEO organization yes. as of today, and which is within FUB. Which That's is within, within FUB. FUB. Yeah. But it's a it's a, probably a bit of close job within FUB today. And okay. the idea is those capabilities to also leverage those more in the new cyber command then. But those services will also migrate it into cyber command probably next year or the year after next year. Okay, so this is this is a focus obviously. It it's takes one, out, it's yeah. part of the focus. This, yeah. okay. this Swiss setup where the army in peacetime takes over certain functions uh, that evolve around cyber and cyber defense, active defense, is that the way other countries handle this, or do they have, is the secret service in other countries doing this by its own, mm -hmm. or is this a Swiss specialty? I think Switzerland is very special. If you look at our um, Ministry of Defense, we have something that not many others have. It does a lot of things. It has the armed forces, it has intelligence, but it also has critical infrastructure protection, or at least uh, civil defense, yeah. and that makes it a very, very special department. And I think also the weight it has in the overall architecture, if we go beyond the MOD mm -hmm. now and look at, you know, other actors that are important for, for cybersecurity in Switzerland, it has a lot of resources. And I think that's also reflected in how the new strategy that just came out yeah. last week, I think, um, um, kind of positions the, the VBS, our MOD. Um, so it is, it is very special. And I think there's a strength in there that mm -hmm. we sometimes maybe don't communicate enough about, mm -hmm. also to others. Mm -hmm. But it also makes comparisons a little difficult. And the two uh, new laws, I mean, they're not so new anymore, but the two laws were mentioned, they were absolutely crucial. So the one for the in intelligence, but also mm -hmm. for the military, where these tasks are now clearly separated. And there is an ability to make sure that, you know, um, it's, there is also a, 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 an oversight that is possible because I think that is one of the topics that are sometimes a bit difficult in, in other countries where you have a destabilization of trust in, in you know, civil society, okay. etc., because you don't fully understand who is doing what in military and intel yeah. in yeah. the cyber domain. And I think Switzerland is in a good position there. Um, so thanks the to the moment. law, these responsibilities are now really clear. I yes, more or less, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's just there is a, a law there that you know very clearly spills out what has to happen in a case of a you know if a critical infrastructure is involved, etc. Yeah. And I think that is is needed, and that is very good that we have that. Okay, sounds interesting. Good. Uh, before we leave that topic, um, reiterate that so you do carry out certain uh, tasks or missions for the Secret Service, and now you raise this to a cyber command level. Uh, I get the feeling this will raise awareness about that. It's becoming more official. It's closer to the nation state afterwards. Is that anticipated? Is this simply acceptable? Yes, this will happen, so be it. Or is it actually something that you want? It's actually not something we really, uh, th that's not the goal of doing this. Okay, that's not the goal. No, it's not the goal, um, but also, I mean, w within the Cyber Command or already today within FUP or CSO, mm -hmm. we have cyber defense as a, as a capacity, capability. Yes. Um, cyber defense is what is like our situ situational awareness in the cyber room, mm -hmm. but it's also mobile cyber troops to support our own armed forces mm -hmm. or maybe help critical, critical infrastructure. Um, the second competence is our cyber fusion center. This mm -hmm. is really defensive part. That's where our security operations center is, where our mill cert is. is. And then the third capability, the third big part, is computer network operations. Okay. And this is for active measures in the cyber room. Okay. So in a normal situation as of today, we're not allowed, not supposed to, to attack or do yeah. active reconnaissance. Mm -hmm. It's always based then on the Intelligence Service Act. And this will remain absolutely the same. And I'm not too much concerned that if you, if you lift it up one level, that that will be more like more visibility. Okay. I'm not too much concerned about that. But as you said, right, I mean, it's all about the legal basis, and the legal basis will remain the same 
even with the new cyber command, it's not going to change. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, in a normal enterprise, big enterprise, army level enterprise or organization, uh, you do operational security by with your security officers. You hire external pen testers to look at your services, new projects, etc. How do you do new projects, new services within the army? Is this something, a capability that you have yourself? Or are you looking up in a phone book and call in a penetration company to test something for you? How is this happening on a practical level? Because I think army must be very different. <laughs> it's not too much different, I would say. I mean, I'm going to disclose a secret to you now. <laughs> we also do external pen testing. You do external we pen do, testing. Yeah, we do, yeah. Actually, we hire companies or we pay companies to do external pen testing. testings. Um, okay. We, well, I'm not going to disclose who is doing it. <laughs> yeah, I guess our audience will be aware of that because they work for these companies. <laughs> Some <laughs> might be aware of that. <laughs> yeah. But other than that, like projects is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So it's not too much of a difference. I mean, different might be like we, we fund those projects. We have mm -hmm. a, a very strict funding cycle in, in administration. Mm -hmm. There's this yearly cycle and a cycle has to go to parliament. But other than that, I would say we handle projects exactly the same way as I experienced in, in my civilian and life. And you have done a lot of civilian I've work. Yeah. Some <laughs> projects in my past. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so there is not such a big difference. No. Then uh, what is, might be different is the public interest or focus that you're getting for these projects. We could say that. Could, Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, of course, leading now slowly into the learning management system. It was the latest breach uh, that was published. Uh, and I was wondering, should you have caught that before it happened? Or why didn't you catch it? Mm. And is that a structural problem that you didn't catch it? Or was it just bad luck? Huh. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, a, it's a bit more complicated than just okay. this. I mean, first of all, we have to differentiate. We differentiate two different types of, of IT infrastructure. We have the infrastructure really for armed forces which is being used in, in operations of our armed forces. And then we have all the administrative systems, and we call them green and blue systems. And blue is really what is part of the administration. Mm -hmm. And for blue systems, we do what every other company also does, we outsource. Mm -hmm. So first of all, we buy the system, we buy software, right. and then we give it to someone else to host and run it for us. Mm -hmm. And this learning management system we're referring to was hosted by a third company. Oh, even and hosted by a third company. hosted by uh, a third company. And yeah. it's not a green system, it's a blue system. Yeah. But that doesn't mean we're still responsible and responsibility still comes back to us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was not only one incident, there were well, two. Actual two. Was okay. First one was in January, and this was our cyber conscript course, and they detected the first of these flaws mm -hmm. in the system. And they actually reported it, and we have been able to fix it. And the second one was approximately one month later. Yes, it was a recruit who went home and he still had access or he still had the URL of, of when he had a login and retried again and then he figured that he could still extract data. Yeah. And was actually it was, a, was a, a bit of a, a wake up call for us also. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, potentially there could have been more than 400,000 data sets being lost. So far we couldn't see anything. Yeah. On, we didn't see anything on Darknet or any, anywhere else and haven't been offered to buy it back <laughs> so far. <laughs> <laughs> so we hope that there was no loss of data, yeah. no, no breach really, but yeah. it's, it was a wake-up call for us. Okay. There is one detail uh, that occurred to me when I reread the press release today that you relied on the system provider who apparently also hosts it to do the forensics for you and tell you no, there was no data leakage. Why wouldn't you do this? this forensic analysis yourself? We did, I'm not sure I read the same uh, okay, press okay. release, but <laughs> actually we did. Okay. It was our own cyber fusion center yeah, and right. Miltzer team, and that was really very closely involved in, in um, ana analyzing, analyzing these the log files. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, good. Yeah, let, let's leave this behind. We have read enough about this, and I was pleased to hear that this is a wake-up call for you because it's about operational security as well. Now, I've already mentioned this dirty term, cyber war, that nobody in the room probably likes, but it's used a lot. Uh, I think there is a conceptual flaw in here. When I have a traditional army and uh, that does physical defense or physical attacks, 
then I think it's relatively easy to link an action with a goal. Like say you're interested to get a peninsula somewhere in Europe and then you invade it and then you have it. I think it's much more difficult in the cyber domain to have a certain goal and achieve it with means uh, in cyber, in the virtual world. I mean, you don't want to steal IP addresses. So where am I wrong here? Or is that really a conceptual problem in this whole uh, discourse? How long do I have? <laughs> <laughs> cyber war is my big topic. It's actually how I got into uh, you know, studying cybersecurity and politics. Uh because at the very beginning in the 2000s that was the mobilizer everybody talked about cyber yeah. war and very early on I but also others said drop that term and it's <laughs> not going to help you also please armed forces don't use it because it's wrong and people will have the wrong expectations yeah, absolutely. about yeah. the threat and the response capabilities or the possibilities yeah. I'm sure you know that that pew pew map where you see how oh, yeah, you yeah, know yeah, the, the different you know the, the shoot at each, each other, other. Yeah. And if you don't get that out of people's heads, yeah, also yeah. politicians, you have a problem because you constantly need to explain that cyber operations work differently yeah. and that you have to use them in different ways and you, can't, you cannot invade a country via just cyber. You might use it in addition to military operations. So it's as we part see of a multi-domain operation. Exactly. I mean, uh, uh, the more digitalized we are, the more clear it is that everybody uses cyber means to achieve strategic, political and military goals. I think that is already clear. <coughs> but this idea that you have what was called the strategic cyber war, you know, somebody shoots via the cyber way and that's it. You know, yeah. this is this uh, the die hard scenario where you <laughs> have that movie where you have the cyber terrorists and they basically, you know, the whole country is down yeah. via cyber. So that is completely unreal, but it has a mobilizing um, component to it. The media is also to blame yeah. partially, even though I think they're getting better now <laughs> in being a bit more careful. Um, but um, I don't think we'll get rid of the term because it just signifies something happening in the military realm, uh, but I think it does us a disservice because we keep looking at the military all the time. And we did that mm. before the Snowden revelations, especially yeah. we in, in academia, mm. before it was clear that it's not actually the military <laughs> that we should look at, <laughs> but the intelligence uh, services that have built up capabilities for a completely different type of operation, which is subversion or you know something under the threshold of war, the gray zone, whatever, all those operations mm that we then started seeing also after 2010 uh, more and more where you have different goals. And as I said, I mean, they might be linked to actual military um, invasions. Mm -hmm. If you mm -hmm. look at Ukraine, mm -hmm. for example, you had cyber components there too, but um, they work on a different level. So I would say term cyber war, forget about to use cyber operations and mm -hmm. be very careful in how you talk about the effects and the goals and the motivations that are behind it. And it really only makes sense in a multi-domain operation. Absolutely, yeah. as, uh, a, as an add-on to you know, a bigger goals that you have anyway that are often uh, geopolitical or political, strategic, whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's a tool in a, in a toolbox basically yeah. that, you, that you have at your disposal, just yeah. that. And not more. Yeah, and it's I enough see. that it is, but then we don't <laughs> yeah. really understand it. But it should also be seen in a context. Okay, I think the toolbox idea very much resonates with an army, I suppose. Absolutely, it yeah. gives more options. And uh. I very much agree, and I'm very happy you said that because we also try to avoid the term cyber war. We sometimes use cyber in war, which is yeah. we talk about ends, means, and ways mm -hmm. to achieve a goal and cyber is just a mean, and you mentioned the multi-domain operation, okay. and this is exactly how we think. What concerns me a bit, a lot of people think that cyber is going to replace the existing threats. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's going to make them more dangerous even, and this is the reality now, and cyber is always part of an overall operation, mm -hmm. and as you said before, we never saw actually that cyber will switch off the light in a country on its own, and at the end, in, in military terms, it always has been, and it's going to be, boots on the grounds that make the different difference. And this will stay end. around. It's yeah, that, yeah, what we yeah. see in all these examples. It starts with cyber, but it also starts on political level, yeah. on economical level. <laughs> Criminality plays a big role, and then it's cyber, it's information operation, but then finally those are, it's, those are the boots on the grounds who are going to make the difference, or the, the, yeah, the decision. Yeah. When it gets real somehow. When it gets yeah. real at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yes. Have that. Um, 
Now, there we have the law that defines what the army is allowed to do, where it's going to be employed. Uh, what scenarios do you see or plan with where you see the new cyber command being actually used in the future when it becomes mm -hmm. active? I'm going to start with the most dangerous. It's probably defense operations, so where mm -hmm. there is a, an attack by a state or non-state actor against Switzerland, mm -hmm. where we see cyber being used in such cases. First is to defend our own networks, and then secondly also be prepared to do active measures. Active mm -hmm. measures also to say, um, right now the legal basis is either it's Intelligence Service Act or then it's the Military Act, but then it needs um, Federal Council approval, which yes. is very <laughs> difficult. But then in <laughs> case of a real conflict, the Army then can conduct on, on its own, like responsibility, can conduct attacks. Okay. So okay. this will be the extreme, one extreme. And what we also see is in case of severe cyber attacks against um, critical infrastructure. But then this will be like in COVID, like supporting the hospitals. Mm -hmm. This is not a, an, 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 this will be also on how we call it, um, subsidiary yes. to civilian um, needs. So the army can then go and help critical infrastructure. And this is also we're prepared to do. Mm -hmm. And we're going to prepare ourselves with mobile cyber teams to do that. But that's not something actually I really expect because it's always every company, every network, every critical infrastructure is different. And at the moment where the attack already happened, there's not a lot we can do anymore. So it's more about crisis management, about seeing whether the backup was there or not. So I'm not sure this is really something, a realistic picture. In prevention of a cyber attack, it's very difficult because the weakest part is always the human being. So it's the human sitting in front of a, of a computer. And we cannot put a soldier besides every user making sure he doesn't click that email or open that <laughs> attachment. So I'm not sure this is really a realistic scenario, but mm -hmm. we prepare for that. Okay. Yes, I get that. I was pleased to hear uh, that you don't really expect that scenario because it's somewhere a bit in the room with national cyber strategy and the army is now doing that. And mm. I think a lot of people are afraid that the army is knocking on the door. Please, please give me a keyboard. I want to connect to your network now. <laughs> so good to hear this is not very likely. Um, Switzerland, uh, or our national uh, teams, uh, took part at the European MailCert exercise in February. Uh, we also were invited to participate at the NATO Lock Shields um, exercises. I think they happen every year, every two years. Uh, is this something that is important for an army like ours? Do you compete for fun or is it actually interesting for you to learn? There might be some fun to it, which is not, <laughs> which is not completely wrong. No, but for us, it's important. It's, it's kind of a benchmarking mm -hmm. because we cannot benchmark with like the economy. We cannot benchmark with banks. And it's also, it's like relationship building or a network building with other like counterparts in other countries. And this is really very fruitful and important to us. And also what we have seen in the past, lock shields you mentioned. Also to us, it was important to see where we stand and it was also like for, for, for us, it was good to see we're not at the end, but we were not the, the winners neither, but then we were somewhere in the midfield. But it was good to see that. So with our, we don't have like the budgets other countries have. And it was very important to see for me also that we spent the, much for, uh, the budget for the right capabilities. Yeah, so that's yeah. like kind of a benchmarking right. to us. And also it was kind of fun also. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to hear. Uh, do you think that is generally something that armies struggle with to like the benchmarking, where are we? Are we mm. good? Is that for a serious lack of wars to, to mm. train or? <coughs> yeah, of course it's hard to benchmark because a lot of it is secret. That is, that is mm. the nature of the cyber domain yeah. because a lot of it is in the intel, a lot of it is about capabilities and practices that you just don't see. Even getting budgets is mm. difficult. That's why, you know, visiting other countries and trying to find out what they're really doing is I'm sure important. Mm. Um, the benchmarking and the exercising, I think we could do more here. Um, uh, the budget was, was mentioned, but it's something that we at, at the ATR also think um, should be supported more, not only for the Swiss, but also in general um, to have a, a, a good wargaming or tabletop exercising mm -hmm. capability that people can, can draw on, um, especially in the cyber domain, especially then also going beyond the cyber, because one of the things 
that are difficult? Are those scenarios that are likely have a cyber component, but not only? Mm. And how do you exercise that? How because do you get those teams together yeah. that, you know, then, because there, I think that is where the difficulty will come from. It's not, if you get the like-minded people together that already know each other, you might have a good uh, exchange daily anyway, you understand each other. But what if then suddenly you have somebody from a hospital that you need to talk to? Those are the difficult scenarios, and I think more could be done here. Okay, um, so that becomes a cultural issue afterwards. I think so. No longer a technical issue, oh yes, it definitely. becomes about humans. I mean, that's my big topic also. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, nothing here was technical yeah. so far, but I think we have a tendency still to think cybersecurity too technical. Yeah. And we often forget the other skills that are needed. I mean, some were mentioned, crisis management has nothing to do with the technical. You need different skills. Mm -hmm. And I think we're also, when we think about recruitment or you know the, the workforce in the future or education, mm -hmm. We sometimes forget to think about those interconnections to other realms. What do we need also, you know, of course, the forensics was mentioned to the law, also the policy field, which is mine. What kind of specialists do we need that understand interlinkages between cyber or the next thing that's <laughs> coming? And <laughs> we, I hope we can talk about the future because now we're just saying cyber and we think we know what cyberspace is, but who knows what, I what we have in 10 years, it might look different mm, yeah. than what we have now mm. and how do we make sure that we have people that understand that the future, <laughs> future <laughs> technology um, because I mean that is a big problem also with education we constantly educate backwards basically we have our ideas and then we educate in four years times we have the specialists but maybe they're they don't fit anymore yeah, yeah that is I a possibility that, and I think that's a challenge absolutely not only for the armed mm -hmm. forces yeah. for everybody also for us educators higher education yeah. How do you make sure you have people that can smartly adjust to new developments also yeah. in, in technology? For the next politics. 40 years after they yeah, leave university. Yeah, hopefully, yes, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <Well>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, uh, let's talk about artificial intelligence. Uh, before you became head, uh, chief of the Swiss Army, you already, as the head of the FURP, pushed for artificial intelligence, or you mentioned in public speeches that this was an important topic for you, that you were developing capabilities. I looked up a presentation uh, at the Cyber Defense Campus or the organization before it, where you, you, would s you were quoted saying, foreseeable future will add, so artificial intelligence will in the foreseeable future add a new dimension to decision making. In January, when you gave an interview in the NZZ, uh, you or um, your uh, successor as a leader of the FUP said that sensor will be equipped with artificial intelligence or the processing of sensor signals will be equipped with artificial intelligence to imp or condense the data they're re receiving into knowledge mm. somehow. Is this one of the capabilities that you want to focus on, on uh, mm -hmm. the cyber command or how, where do we stand two years later? Is mm -hmm. the foreseeable future already here, or how foreseeable is it? <laughs> it actually, it's it's foreseeable as we we're in the process of planning it right now. Mm -hmm. What I was referring to then is what we call the sensor to shoot loop, or we have sensors, then we have our intelligence service internally, then we have the decision making, and then we have the like the effectors where we provide an effect mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and. Digitalization for armed forces means also to, to automate that cycle and mm -hmm. digitalize it. And with sensors, the idea is really to out of all operational spheres to take sensor data out of like the air, space, ground, electromagnetic room, and integrate those sensor data to recognize new um, patterns in that mm -hmm. and gain knowledge out of that. That mm -hmm. was what we were referring to. Yes. And in order to do that, because data becomes so big, if you start to integrate all sensors and all spheres, that needs artificial intelligence. Yeah. There's one application of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. There's another one, and when I talk about cyber artificial intelli intelligence, I'm always referring to the good, the bad, the ugly application of artificial intelligence. Good is where we use it to recognize an intruder in our networks yeah. that can be used for that. The bad application of artificial intelligence might be to, to break hash codes, and the ugly might be to use artificial intelligence to intrude and mm -hmm. to actually to fulfill tasks which took months so far 
if you go into a network, this horizontal mm -hmm. um, detection that takes weeks or months, and we fear a bit or we see, we have concerns that this could be done in, in hours in the future using artificial intelligence. Thanks to artificial intelligence. Yes, okay. that would okay. be the good, the bad, the ugly application of artificial okay. intelligence. Okay. And this okay. will be actually a concern of cyber command. The automation and digitalization of sensor to shoot the loop, the cyber command will provide the digital infrastructure, but then this will be the op joint operation command yeah. conducting yeah. those kinds of, of um, okay. actions then. Mm -hmm. You confirmed uh, that it's a lot of data, so a lot of signals coming from these sensors, yeah. and it's more than humans can possibly process. That's Absolutely. why you want artificial intelligence. Yeah. Now, uh, on a conceptual level, you don't control the signal of the sensor. That's the point of the sensor is placing it there, and then your enemy triggers the signal. Mm -hmm. So you're basing your uh, knowledge or intelligence on signals controlled by the enemy somehow. And that is then something you base your decision on. Uh, is this too short thought? <laughs> I'm not sure. I mean, what we do is what we do today is we have human sensors also detecting what they see, what they hear, what they get. Yes. And in the future, the, this will be digital sensors that's going to be replaced, but it's always the same. So either you see an aircraft or not, or you hear it, or you detect it in the electromagnetic sphere. That's not going to change. It's just a lot more of data, and it's the way we integrate it. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure I buy into this, because I think if, um, if an expensive system, especially if it's a, a, a pet project by the big boss, say something, it's yeah. very different from a human person saying, look, I got the feeling I've seen an airplane. Because this is afterwards, it's like on paper, it's printed. This is now official. And in a very hierarchical organization like the army, somebody to question such an official statement by a machine will be very hard. I don't even think this is, comes down to hierarchy. So it's more kind of, sure, still the analysts will be human beings, isn't it? So we gain out of the sensors, we gain information. But then knowledge is only a human being who makes knowledge out of that. And it will, at least in Swiss Armed Forces, will always be a human who makes the decision. So I'm not too concerned about that. Uh, and that doesn't relate to hierarchy. It's always an analyst and he will receive a lot of data and we, he will have to make up his own mind on, on what the, the, the intention of an enemy might be. So this mm -hmm. is always an analyst. I'm not too concerned about okay, that. Okay, you're not too concerned. But the, 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 the amount yeah. of data is going to grow. Yeah. And the new opportunity is not having more data, but to integrate the data out of all the spheres. So space, air, ground, and electromagnetic room, and also information room. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a new aspect to it. Okay, okay, yeah, I think I get that. I presume that Switzerland is doing what other armies are doing in this domain. Yes, uh, probably less than some big okay. ones, as we yeah. know, but not yeah. because they uh, don't want to, but because the big movers are, you know, Switzerland is too small to be a big mover in, in AI right now. It's also about data, and we know that a few, you know, in, in terms of geopolitics, data becomes much more important also for the training of systems for, for AI systems, etc. So for me, one of the big topics in the future is access to data. So okay. we are also trying to push for open data, a movement also in the European Union for open data, uh, so that you know there is a, some. It's al almost like a, a democratic approach to AI that everybody can actually start training AI systems. Mm -hmm. uh, also, for example, so that we can see whether there are biases in the system. This is more important for the civilian domain right now already. You know where you have facial recognition that. We know that from the States, for example, doesn't recognize black faces yeah. or female black faces because the machine is only trained on men all the time. And white, white men. White, white men, men, exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so there are a lot of biases that could come in. And I think with the, um, uh, in the military domain, the, the big fear, and that, but that has been discussed for, for many years already, is the lethal armed weapons systems which shoot by themselves. And we are far from that. I think. Uh, and, and, and Mr. Ciesli has said it, this is not, um, you know, in mm -hmm. our, we, we don't plan to do that. So that the, the um, I'm not saying nobody plans that's to do it. Yeah, <laughs> no, no. So that's why there's a lot of uh, debate on the international okay. level about banning those systems because they're potentially uh, dangerous. 
Um, but uh, I think to whether there's a human in the loop or not, that is the big difference. Yeah. And so far, uh, most armies have a human mm, in, in the, the loop, loop. even and the big ones. And we're grateful for that. <laughs> <laughs> we are, yeah, but who knows what the world looks like if the machine takes over. Maybe it's a better world, who oh knows? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I think what's important with technologies and if you start linking them up with politics and war and all these kind of things is always to uh, balance your views. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, to, to, to see the, the good, the bad and the ugly because there's n never just one aspect there. And, mm -hmm. and uh, the tendency of human beings to either love technologies, that's the yeah, optimists, yeah. or hate technologies, is something that we all have in us, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we should have to, we have to balance and we have to look at it very carefully. Yeah, AI is a yeah. very good case in point. Like, it's already there in cybersecurity. You have AI applications, mm. machine learning for offense or defense. Mm. Whether the one or the other is going to be better, we simply cannot answer this question. It's impossible. Yeah. It's a very dynamic um, um, also development that goes into the future and will have a lot to do with governance or integration into organizations, for example. A technology by itself doesn't really yeah. tell you a lot about what is going to happen. Uh, and we kind you of to need to do this to learn. Anyway. Yeah, you, I mean, and you cannot stop AI and machine learning at this point in time. That, that is, I mean, yeah. and quantum, that's yeah, the that next that big topic that's also going to come. That's why I'm saying we are now still in this, also with the term cyber defense, assumes that there is a system that we constantly need to patch because it has vulnerabilities and nobody knows them all. AI is used to actually discover yeah. vulnerabilities, so that's a good uh, use of, yeah. of AI right now. Um, but... I am not sure that this is the future. We mm. might really have a completely different digital, let's say, un supra or infrastructure there that we you know, could start thinking about that mm -hmm. might no longer be linked to this, um, let's say, cat and mouse game. <laughs> okay, yes, I'm getting this. That is, that is optimistic, but uh, it's, yeah, it's yeah, possible. Okay. Good, I, if, I'm, if I'm reading through different strategy papers, not only the army, but all the national cyber strategy, contingency plans, etc. And it resonates a lot with your research papers or research papers of your think tank or uh, central strategic studies at the ATH. Um, so I guess there is an exchange happening here. Obviously, yes. th this Ho is your, your <laughs> Many, many, Could many years. years. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I sure yeah, hope yeah. so. Yeah, yeah. Would, would you say that Switzerland or the army is a good student? Oh, oh, absolutely. But yeah. they're not students. I think we don't educate anybody. We really just propose, you know, um, options. We often do, um, we study how others do it. Yeah, you ask me, yeah. how does Switzerland uh -huh. compare? Very often we, we look at approaches uh, of other countries and then uh, kind of draw lessons from that. And then often in a dialogue with like it's our partners yeah, in, yeah. In, in the administration, we, we start talking about um, okay, you know, what could be changed or not. Is so it's like a, uh, an autonomous execution of your ideas. <laughs> uh, not always, <laughs> of course. No, yeah. it should be an, an input into a process yes. that is not ours to steer. So it's an invitation to read yeah, you know, no. <laughs> <laughs> interesting <laughs> things. Um, but I mean, uh, the, I, I would say that the administration and the army belongs to the administration is its own animal. Yeah. And as because you asked yeah. in Switzerland, there's many, many, many peculiarities that we need to know. And one of them is that you cannot steer just from one end and then you know uh, expect it to go into the direction that you it's that you hope it will yeah it's probably not working in Switzerland. no yeah, yeah. no and <laughs> probably <laughs> not so in much. other countries yeah, either but well. i mean th that that's a reality and i think trial and error is important too and learning is always you know doing certain things badly and then changing them and i think we've come a long way and with the new strategy as i said i think uh, that everything's there that needs to be there the roles are clear, roles, responsibilities, and the different tasks. Whether that will be executed, as you <laughs> <it is> said, <laughs> that is a different thing, but I think the base is, 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 is there. Is good. Yeah. Mm. Very good. Yeah. Good to hear. <laughs> um, I got the impression there is an ongoing struggle between um, the civil part of cyber defense, or let's say Melanie, MCSC, and the army. Like, who is given, or particularly can. NCSC, can Florian Schutz give you orders on security, on server hardening? Can they request your data to analyze it themselves? And it seems they're an advantage right now. And 
I think it was in the January interview that you gave, you said, we're going to overhaul the law because this is the army's domain and we want to remain completely autonomous. Is, is that the situation? Is there this rat race or uh, this continuous struggle? The, the question is on, on what data we exchange actually and what mm -hmm. we talk about. First of all, we accept very much what Florian Schütz is doing. And what he did, he, he established like a map of all we do at, at administration level. And then he identified white spots. He is in process of filling them now. And he always he also de detected duplication. But then I referred to what I was explaining before, the green and the blue type yes. of systems. And the problem with the green systems is, first of all, they are fully encapsulated, not connected to our other infrastructure. Okay. So it's like an island. And it's easier to protect. And then also, many of those systems are classified. Mm -hmm. So if we close flaws in those systems, and those information goes into another system and to another system, mm -hmm. so if someone actually gets hold of that data, it's very easy then to break it. Mm -hmm. So that's our concern. So what we say is actually we exchange information on flaws we detect ourselves in that in environment. Mm -hmm. We exchange that. We respect very much um, his ideas, his concepts, and also his instructions, but we apply it on our, in our own responsibility. Okay. That's actually the differentiation. Okay. And right now the law, the, le the legal basis for our own systems is still that the, the systems of armed forces are still part of the administration. Mm -hmm. which is not ideal in every case, especially so when it comes separated to... Separated more. Yes, yeah. and okay. that's the idea. Doesn't, okay. And also to say we work very closely with Melanie. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say it's on a, uh, even on a daily basis, so there's a very mm -hmm. close cooperation, so there's no reason for concerns. And mm -hmm. also after the interview and answer set, yeah. I had a chat with Florian Schütz. I think he was a bit upset in the beginning, but then we have been very, very able to explain to him why what we actually need this separation. And, and how you differentiate between the blue and the green systems. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, th I think it's also a relief to him because in those systems, in those green systems, classified, separated, isolated, he won't to be too much involved in that. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, we're soon coming to an end here. Uh, and um, I need to select uh, my remaining questions now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, let's return to cyber politics, your research topic. What are you researching right now? Oh, yes. Uh, how long do I have uh, now? <laughs> you have no. three minutes. Uh, because <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think something that has become apparent um, in the last few years is the importance of private companies in cybersecurity, but also actually in shaping cyber threat knowledge. And I'm referring to uh, um, you know, threat intel companies, mm -hmm. many of them American. Um, that, f at least for us, again, academics or civil society, us people in the society, they provide the knowledge that we have of what's going on mm -hmm. in cyberspace. And very clearly, this is hugely biased mm -hmm. because there's a commercial interest, there is a closeness to the political um, decision making already. Many people, you know, go in and out of, of, of politics and, and back to, to companies. And that is an issue that we have. We believe we do not have the full knowledge. We do not know who shoots first. I'm using a horrible yeah. term now. Um, we don't, and if we do not have a better and let's say broader idea of the cyber threat landscape, we cannot understand political dynamics well. And so that, that links to this open data discourse exactly. as well. So yeah. this is something that we are working towards. Um, I can't tell you what the solutions will be, but one idea is obviously that, that academic institutions could take a, a stronger role here also to provide uh, threat, cyber threat knowledge or attribution knowledge, because mm -hmm. very often this is about attribution, that yeah. somebody points a finger at somebody else and we cannot really verify um, whether that's true Good. or not. Yeah. So uh, that. that is something that we're working on and that mm. I think is, uh, is important also for a better understanding, as I said, of the dynamics, but also what can be done in cyber and what the effects are, not only in cyber, but you know, societal, mm -hmm. political, so et cetera. So implications it has. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Great, it's interesting. Uh, you, s uh, you mentioned that the Cyber Defense Compass, or we got the impression, is, it's a project that is dear to you. It is, uh, it is a new initiative that brings together capabilities. It, I reckon it integrates with all the recruitment you're doing, the, the recruits that you're educating. Um, 
what is your vision there? Where, where do you want to take this? Actually, I think what is really missing for armed forces is very difficult to part to, to talk to academia. I mean, except ETH. <laughs> <laughs> there's so <laughs> open. I, I, I have to say this now. No, not really. I mean, there's close cooperation, and, and even they, uh, in our capability development process, ETH CSS is very important because what you do is you actually you prove our concepts and give us feedback, and that's the, the importance mm -hmm. of this relationship. But to us, it's very difficult to get access to startups and mm -hmm. companies, and. The Cyber Defense Campus to me is a neutral platform where everyone okay. can meet, where armed forces, where economy, academia can come together, exchange information in a, or, or build a network in a neutral environment. And that's the importance of that. And then the other idea is to sooner or later build an ecosystem, a cyber ecosystem in Switzerland, where actually the economy, big companies, can state their requirement for cyber tools and then Cyber Defense Campus could be the platform where they initiate the building of those solutions yeah, and you. tools together with startups yes. and our forces. Create spin-up startups. Absolutely. Yeah. So my final vision mm -hmm. is this ecosystem. Oh, so that sounds very Israeli to me, somehow. There is an idea. Actually, in Israel we see Beersheba, mm -hmm. but then we see also like Team 8. And mm -hmm. Team 8 follows a very similar approach. So mm -hmm. there's also a relationship, a huge network to the industry. So they get ideas and then they build solutions to them. But it's always commercially driven, uh, at least what I see. Yeah, yeah. And this would be more like government driven, mm -hmm. this approach. Ah, okay. Yeah, that is so a, di that it's, is a it's difference. It's something yeah. new and maybe something, it's a bit, we always call this healthetism. So it's the healthetic solution, the Swiss <laughs> solution <laughs> yeah. to the same That's issue. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lieutenant General Susli, Mrs. Duncan Cavalti. Uh, that was an interesting talk. Uh, unfortunately, we have to cut it uh, at a given moment. Uh, thank you for your interest for or in this cyberstorm in a nutshell. We'll be back in August with our next edition. We plan to talk about or talk with security startups in Switzerland. And on October 13, uh, there will actually be the Swiss Cyberstorm Conference. We hope to do this a couple of stories up here in the Kursaal in Bern as a physical conference, and if that fails for de whatever reason, <laughs> I mean, can think of anything, then it's going to be a virtual conference, but we really plan to push through. Thank you very much. <laughs>